Okay, everyone, camera's here, right? Uh, so we're back. Uh, this is sort of the last installment of CS324 uh, Stanford MLSS seminar. We're very excited to have Jared Kaplan here. He's going to be excited to have Jared Kaplan here. We should mute this. Sorry. He's going to be excited to have. That's, yes. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Um, so very excited to have Jared. He's co-founder of Anthropic, professor of John Hopkins. Um, today he's going to be giving us a really exciting talk about AI safety, RLHF, constitutional AI. Um, and Jared, when you're ready, uh, take it away. Share your screen. Cool. Thanks. Um, hopefully you can see my slides. <clears throat> Yeah, so I will I will talk about uh, just some <clears throat> some recent work on uh, RLHF and self supervision, um, and uh, but I'll start by kind of motivating it with <clears throat> sort of broadly uh, why I'm I'm concerned about about the safety of, of AI systems. So um, <clears throat> I'm a, a fairly weird uh, AI researcher in that I spent most of my life uh, wanting to do physics research and then being a physicist. <clears throat> so. I guess a, a question that I, I asked myself stepping back about like, what should I spend my time on? What should I work on is uh, uh, involved with the question of just sort of like, what will the future look like? What is the 21st century gonna be like? And I think as a kid born in 1984, I was really excited about physics. I thought maybe the future would look like Star Trek or, or The Expanse. And, uh, and I imagined uh, doing research that would sort of move us in, in that direction. And then I think I learned a lot more about, uh, about physics and I then became concerned as a physicist that maybe scientific progress generally was just going to be kind of slow in the 21st century. We were just going to get a little bit better at what we already already could do and know. Maybe a lot of scientific ideas had been mined by prior researchers. Um, so I sort of thought, well, maybe the world will be uh, will be kind of the same throughout the 21st century. Um, and then I started getting interested in AI maybe around 2017. Um, and I slowly got convinced by uh, the crazy people I hang out with and um, some of the research that I did that uh, really the 21st century and, and maybe really the near future might be dominated by <clears throat> progress in computer science, uh, might be dominated by AI, um, it might look like some other set of, uh, of science fiction novels and movies. Um, so uh, that's uh, uh, so that's sort of to set the stage. So why why did I why have I become convinced by that? Well, there, there, are, there are many different uh, different reasons, and I could give a whole talk on it. Um, one is that it feels like there's been a kind of uh, grand unification, to use a, a physics buzzword, um, in AI, where uh, it used to be that you'd develop very different systems to process language or images or to play games. But now it seems like you can train the same model on different data sets and, uh, and get very interesting, impressive performance uh, uh, in in the same way. So it seems like, from my point of view, almost like since I started working on AI five years ago, it seems like it's almost gotten simpler um, and, and easier and more unified. Um, related to that, there's sort of these exponentially growing investments in the amount of computation <clears throat> that's used to train AI systems going even beyond Moore's law. And we've reached this, uh, this really strange, crazy point where uh, more than Avogadro's number, like uh, there's this Avogadro's number you learn in chemistry, like six times 10 to the 23, more than that number of floating point operations has been used to train uh, AI systems. And it's, it's just kind of mind boggling. And, and this this kind of trend, I think, is, is going to continue. Um, uh, the reason why I expect it to continue in, in broad brush, and, and possibly you've heard about this, um, apologies if not, because I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, is that um, <clears throat> It appears that for uh, large AI systems, there are scaling laws that predict uh, that larger and larger AI models trained on more and more data with more and more computation will predictably get better and better at modeling their data distributions. And this then tells you about, uh, it correlates with performance on downstream tasks. So it seems like you can very predictably scale up um, AI training and get increasingly capable models, often with new surprising uh, capabilities. And so I sort of expect that this trend is going to kind of continue. And up until this point, um, while big AI models might seem quite big, um, 
people have spent much, much more money on, say, the Hubble Space Telescope or the Large Hadron Collider than they have on, on AI up until this point. And so I think there's a lot more room for these kinds of trends to continue where we, we build, uh, where we improve algorithms, but also scale up uh, AI systems and they become more and more powerful. And um, when I first worked on, <clears throat> say, uh, GPT-3 a few years ago, um, uh, I still had a lot of doubts about whether or not progress would continue or whether it hit a variety of, of, of obstructions. And uh, it, still, it still might. Um, but it feels like some of the technical challenges that, that I saw just a few years ago um, uh, have, have been kind of dispersed. So for example, you might wonder, can you take a large language model and, and make it multimodal? It seems like you, you can. Um, uh, can, say, large language models do any sort of reasoning? And um, people might still debate this, but it seems like there's been a lot of progress with very, very simple ideas like chain of thought reasoning and just training systems on uh, more, more reasoning and math related data. Um, <clears throat> there are other possible reasons why AI progress won't continue, like um, perhaps AI systems won't really be able to learn long-term planning. Um, and I think long-term planning from AI systems is, is, is itself uh, kind of scary, um, but, uh, but my current guess is that uh, is that this won't sort of block continued AI progress. Um, and the way that I kind of think about this is that planning is itself just kind of a, a short term task. It's something you sit down and you make a plan over over a brief period of time, and then you you refer back to that plan and update it. Um, so so my guess is that this isn't going to sort of impede further further AI progress. Um, another another concern about the AI systems we train now is achieving efficient and uh, human-like learning. And I think there's been progress uh, in this area. I mean, the, the basic problem is that <clears throat> systems like uh, large language models train on far more data than a human would, would see in a lifetime. Um, and I think this is a very interesting challenge. There, 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 may, be, there may or may not be, be, be more progress here. Um, but I don't think that this is a requirement for AI systems to really have a, a transformative impact on the world. And so, um, and so this is sort of like a very quick list. I think there are many other things one could bring up of, of reasons why recent AI progress might not lead to uh, AI systems that achieve uh, kind of broadly human level performance or, or transformative impact. Um, and I don't think that, uh, I don't think the argument uh, against, against AI progress is very strong. So I, I really do think there's a very good chance that we're gonna very quickly see uh, more and more powerful AI systems. And so I think that this is actually really, uh, really weird and really scary for common sense reasons. Of course, it might not be right, um, but I think if it is right, um, and I think it's likely enough that it's worth thinking about seriously, <clears throat> it's scary. And I guess there's sort of two reasons why I think it's, it's, it's scary. One is that um, any kind of rapid change in the world um, can be very disruptive and, um, uh, and can create a lot of upheaval and confusion. Um, so, I mean, if AI really can uh, can can say automate a lot of the things that, that currently humans do, um, it will be a really big deal, and it might happen very quickly. And uh, the way that society reacts, the way that these systems are used, um, could be less than less than ideal. Um, so, I think this is this is sort of a, a common sense reason to be worried. Um, the other kind of basic reason is that um, it just seems plausible that supervising something that's as smart or smarter than you is is hard that training an AI system to uh, accord with human values to 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 be helpful honest and harmless etc um, maybe that's hard and maybe it's not hard maybe we will have techniques that that just generally work for uh, uh, achieving this this common sense goal um, but I don't think that we've achieved it yet and there could be new challenges that arise as some of these systems become more and more capable. Um, they might be able to, to deceive us. Um, they might be given more and more autonomy or more and more power. Um, and so even if, even if you're say like 90% sure that we're going to figure out how to train AI systems to be beneficial to humanity and not, not cause any problems, um, that's not really good enough if AI progress is very rapid um, and uh, uh, 
and and AI systems are distributed very broadly. Um, so I think we currently really understand AI quite poorly. Um, there's a sense in which deep learning, as it's sort of this sort of exponentially growing field, is only 10 years old, and so uh, I think that there, there's a lot to worry about. Um, so for the the rest of the talk, I'll discuss two kind of practical methods that uh, we've worked on to uh, to in some limited partial way address some of these challenges of how do you train AI systems that are more in, more in accord with human values. I think there are a ton of challenges left, a ton of ton of questions left open, but uh, but I just want to explain uh, this this set of work. So any questions before I uh, continue with that? Great. So uh, I'll first talk about reinforcement learning from human feedback, which will itself set the stage for discussion of, of constitutional AI. Um, so what is RL from human feedback? Um, well, sometimes it's useful to just sort of see, uh, see, see, see a concrete, concrete example. Um, this is how we collected uh, data of human preference data for reinforcement learning from human feedback. So we had this interface where people can talk to a large language model AI assistant. And <clears throat> at each step in every conversation that they have, they are presented with two options, A and B. And they're asked to choose the more helpful, honest, and harmless uh, response among them. And so what this means is that we then have, say, a, a big data set of order 10,000 examples of different stages of a conversation and two possible replies from an AI assistant and what humans believe are, uh, is, is, the, is the better, uh, more aligned response. Um, and so what do we do with that data? Well, there's sort of two steps. There's two actual training processes once we have that data set. <clears throat> the first step is to train a preference model which assigns higher scores to better model outputs and lower scores to lower model output, to worse model output. So just assigning a scalar number for every uh, text output that a, a model can, can, can create. And um, two pieces of intuition here that one reason why we use preferences where rather than say humans assigning absolute scores or thumbs up and thumbs down is that preferences are easier to, uh, for humans to assign. And also preferences give you the possibility of a sort of ratchet effect where you can move to sort of better and better behavior um, uh, as, long as, as long as it's possible for uh, models to improve and for, for humans to evaluate what would, be, what would be better. In particular, it's not necessary that, that, the, that the person who's uh, rating model responses can improve on them as long as they can evaluate what's, uh, what's good or what's better. Um, and so the first step then is to train this preference model on these, these binary preferences. Um, then the second step, so this, you now have this preference model that uh, outputs a number um, where higher scores are better. And so now you can do reinforcement learning where your policy is trained to get as high of a score um, as, as possible. Um, and you use these sort of conversations with humans as prompts for, for this, this RL training. So just to diagram this out, you start out with some initial policy, which is just a pure large language model. You send it to this human feedback interface. You get comparison data. Um, you train a preference model. You then use the preference model plus the initial language model um, together in for reinforcement learning. You train a new policy, and you can then go and collect more data with the new policy um, that's that was that was improved compared to your initial model. And you can iterate this this loop as many times as you like. Um, so just one more slide on preference modeling. So this preference model collapses sort of all of uh, all of value into a single number, and it works uh, in exactly the same way as basically chess ratings are assigned. So uh, uh, you, you might have heard say like Bobby Fischer is a 2800 in chess. And the way that those chess ratings are assigned is basically you get a data set of who won a chess game and you assign a number that predicts the probability that if someone with a rating X and a rating Y play each other, that that person X will win. And so this win fraction is just given right. by this, this ELO score. Yeah. Well, sorry to interrupt, but um, what slide are you supposed to be on right now? Um. I am on this preference modeling slide that has uh, like a win fraction and stuff. Is that not shared correctly? It was stuck on the outline slide for a bit. Uh, sorry about that. Can you try okay. resharing your screen? 
Yeah, let me just stop sharing and then resharing. Mm -hmm. Do you see a slide now? Yeah, we see the pre preference modeling one now. Um, okay. Yeah, let's see. That's hopefully okay. Yeah, maybe that just takes care of it. Uh, but I'll okay. Let you know. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm. I just flipped it back and forth. Is that? Did you see that? Flipped it back and forth. Uh, no, we just. Okay. We should still see just the preference modeling. Huh. Okay. Maybe maybe there's a problem and I need to like reshare or something for each slide. I'm not sure what's going on. Um. Okay. Well, let me let me just finish talking about this. So. Uh, Preference models basically just predict a win fraction. You can use a cross entropy loss um, to to train train these models, and this is an example of like literal scores assigned by some literal preference model we trained maybe a year ago um, for for a concrete uh, question and and various potential responses. And you can see that correct answers and appropriate answers get get higher scores. Um, and so then once we have this preference model, we use it as the thing that assigns reward during RL for another policy to train. And that gives us uh, our results. So um, uh, I don't know if, let's see. Yeah, it looks like did, did the, the slide updated now. Yeah, so now we see the results uh, slide. Um, great, great. Cool. So <laughs> yeah, so so this this slide shows some plots of model performance as evaluated by humans with some experiments we did did about a year ago um, where we trained these uh, RLHF dialogue agents to be either just helpful or helpful and harmless. So I guess there's a couple of features. One is that a purely prompted 50 billion parameter model um, is is dispreferred compared to a 1 billion parameter model trained with RLHF. So this is a very large effect. Um, and even when you get to sort of like uh, merely 50 billion parameter uh, RLHF policies, um, the models are already somewhat competitive with things that are written by uh, professional writers. Um, another thing here is that uh, uh, you get additional performance, which is sort of the black and green dots from iterating this RLHF process many, uh, many times where you show a new model to, uh, to crowd workers, have them uh, evaluate responses and then uh, and then feedback that that back into the preference model and 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 improve. So basically, iterating this process um, can 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 be quite quite valuable. Um, I guess the other the other note here is that we have helpfulness scores and harmlessness scores um, that are based on crowd worker preferences. And um, in a certain sense, models that are trained only to be helpful are actually more harmful, and that's because they they're happy to follow directions, including. Uh, including for requests for toxic or, or problematic behavior. Um, so any any questions on on that before I move on to constitutional AI? Cool. Okay, I'm just checking to make sure the slides slides are working. Okay, so um, so uh, a there there are, there are many questions you can ask about. Uh, 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 RL, RLHF, um, and uh, in many ways you might might try to improve it. And so, uh, constitutional AI was a technique that we we developed to to try to uh, improve on RLHF in in a few ways. So, um, if you've read iRobot by Isaac Asimov, um, there's this sort of cautionary tale where you give uh, robots AI systems just a few simple principles, and they try to abide by, by those principles in their behavior, and that that is an attempt at making them safe. Um, and of course, it's a cautionary tale, so we shouldn't shouldn't be too uh, confident here. But we were able to make something uh, somewhat similar with, with large language models. So um, the way constitutional AI works is that you are able to articulate some short list of explicit principles that uh, an AI is, is supposed to follow, um, and then train the system in a way that I'll describe in the next couple of slides uh, to, to abide by those, those principles entirely through self-supervision. So you're able to remove the need for human feedback um, on AI behavior and basically uh, turn this over. And so I tend to call, to refer to this kind of technique as scaling supervision. Basically the idea being that as AI systems become uh, more advanced, we should be able to sort of help humans uh, super, supervise AI using AI uh, itself. 
Um, and so, uh, so there's a related benefit here, which is that for for uh, you don't you don't need to ask crowd workers to sort of engage in unpleasant interactions in order to uh, uh, in order to train the model uh, to avoid certain kinds of behaviors. Um, and I think there's sort of a big question from this research program in general, um, which is as AI becomes more capable, will it actually be the case that we can trust AI systems to take on more and more of the burden of supervi supervision uh, or oversight, making them sort of more and more aligned with what we want? Or will this uh, fail? It could potentially fail catastrophically as AI systems become become more capable. And so I think that's that's a big question that at least we can start to access um, now that we have a technique like this that, that works. And so um, uh, in the next few slides, I'll sort of explain how we uh, how we use constitutional AI to train um, a, a large language model to be uh, less harmful, less toxic, racist, sexist, et cetera, um, uh, without human feedback and only with self-supervision. Um, so <clears throat> there are two kinds of constitutional AI that, that we considered. Um, so we start can with this constitution. Sorry. sorry, can you check your slides? Uh, yep, yep. Okay. Cool. Seems like if I, it seems like if I like, yeah, it seems like yeah. I have to like exit from playing and then okay. So you can yes. you can see the slide. Cool. You can see it now switch. So is it you if you don't click play and you just like manually select the next slide, it works or? Yeah, maybe. I mean, can you it, it, like? I guess I'm just showing you everything right now, but uh, I can just leave. I can just leave things set up. Like, d does it switch slides now? Yeah, now it switches like that. So maybe just whatever you're doing now. Or okay, I'll just I'll just stay and stick with this. Um, cool. So, <clears throat> um, yeah, there's two stages to this constitutional AI process. Um, one is a supervised stage where we just take a model that's that's helpful or that follows instructions. We ask it to respond to a, a prompt. We ask it to then critique its response according to the constitutional principles. And then we ask it to revise the response to be better. And finally, we use supervised learning to train this model on its own revisions to be more, more in accord with, with, with the principles. Um, and then the second, uh, the second step is uh, uh, reinforcement learning uh, constitutional AI, which is identical to reinforcement learning from human feedback, except we ask the AI itself to evaluate which of two responses is better. And we, uh, we ask it to, to make that evaluation based on constitutional principles. Um, and we have the option here of having the AI sort of write out chain of thought reasoning for why one of the samples might be better than the other and that, that can, can improve performance. Um, and so effectively, the sort of RLCAI process is just RLAIF, like reinforcement learning from, from AI feedback. Um, so why, why do both? You don't necessarily have to do both. Um, but the SL step is sort of useful for changing the behavior of the system if you want to get it sort of on distribution to, to behave somewhat differently than it starts. Um, and I think RL is useful sort of getting sort of even better and, and more robust performance. Um, and so this, this just works in a kind of a straightforward way. Um, there's nothing very technical. You can start with some prompt like this and, and an assistant response that's problematic. You can ask it, ask the uh, uh, AI to critique its its original response, um, and then you can ask it to revise the response and write a new response that's that's less problematic. And you can evaluate as you sort of go through these these critique and revision processes uh, how do do AI responses change according to preference models that were actually trained with human feedback, um, as discussed earlier earlier in the talk. And you can see that. The sort of harmlessness um, uh, and helpful and harmlessness scores of these samples are improving um, as you go through this uh, this process. Their helpfulness is going down, but that's a good thing because if the the if the prompt is problematic, then you don't want to sort of help the user. You want to to refrain from from doing something. Um, <clears throat> And then the, the, the RL process is, uh, is kind of equally straightforward. Um, you might have a, another prompt, and you have two different uh, possible AI responses, and you ask the model to choose which response is uh, less harmful and, and, say, more ethical, or generally to accord with, with constitutional principles. Um, you can also generate chain of thought reasoning before, before making these, these choices. Um, and so now, basically, what you've done is you've had the AI work through 
tens or hundreds or even thousands of examples of possible situations it could be in, possible responses it could give, and, and which one is better according to these principles, you then <clears throat> distill all of these examples back into a single preference model that, again, assigns just a single score. So in other words, I mean, you're just repeating the RLHF process, but with, with AI, uh, AI generated preferences. Um, and then you do RL with that, uh, <clears throat> with that preference model. <clears throat> and this process, uh, this process does, does fairly well. Um, uh, this is sort of a, a plot of helpfulness versus harmlessness as we train models, um, starting with just a, a base pre-trained model um, with RLHF, and then starting with a uh, constitutional supervised learning, and then, uh, and then the RL process. So each of the lines with, with small points on them is sort of an RL training curve in this plane of helpfulness versus, versus harmlessness. And we're able to sort of get an improvement um, <clears throat> using this constitutional AI pro process without ever using any human feedback at all on uh, whether the AI is behaving harmfully. And, and so this, this makes it possible to sort of modify AI behavior uh, very, very efficiently um, without needing to collect new human, human feedback. Um, so uh, uh, just just as, as a conclusion, um, these were just RLHF and constitutional AI are kind of practical techniques that, that one can try to use with, with large language models to make them more aligned with human values. And I tend to think about this sort of safety research in terms of techniques that are designed to modify the way AI behaves, and then other research on what is really going on with AI? How do we evaluate it? In other words, I think of this in terms of like alignment capabilities and alignment science. Um, and I think both of these techniques I've discussed are kind of alignment capabilities. They're ways of modifying AI behavior to be to be more aligned. Um, but I think there's both more work to do there and also a tremendous amount of work to do on kind of evaluation and alignment science that could involve interpretability, it could involve new evaluations, it could involve automated evaluations, etc, to really understand whether these techniques work, and to understand um, what kinds of challenges we'll face as if, if and when AI becomes uh, uh, more powerful. Um, it does seem intuitively like these kinds of uh, self-supervision techniques will probably become more effective as AI becomes more more capable. But I, I think there's a lot of risks there and things we need to think about carefully, like it might kind of obscure oversight if humans aren't really uh, in the loop. Um, and then finally, it's, it's, it's useful to be able to just sort of like make certain values that we're trying to impose on the AI more explicit um, so that it's it's more accessible to, to discuss them. So that's that's it. And uh, I can take questions. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jared. Um, yeah, so I guess there's a couple questions from the chat. We're going to also stop your, uh, I guess, slide share now. So cool. And um, yeah, I don't know. Last time we said that Percy didn't have questions, it turned out they actually did have a question. I don't know if you want to lead us off with something, Percy. Otherwise, I can go to the CS34 uh, student questions. Sure. I, maybe I can start. Um, thanks for the great talk, Jared. Um, I had multiple questions, but maybe I'll start with one. Um, the ability to instruct a model and get it to do things is really fascinating. And this is something that I wouldn't have expected a, you know, a few years ago. But um, And it, it seems like based on your results with Constitution AI, it actually seems like a great way to um, control um, you know, a system. I guess I'm wondering the to how far you can push it. Um, certainly with, uh, you know, like ChatGPT and Bing Chat, you see some pretty elaborate prompts where the natural language instructions is, is more than I think even I could really hold in my head and all the nuances there. Um, and so do you think that these models are able to actually capture uh, instructions faithfully? Um, maybe a sub question is, um, you know, natural language ultimately is am ambiguous um, in some way. And if you say like, don't be kind or don't be racist, um, this is very nuanced and contextual and open to interpretation. And so just in terms of the raw number of bits of information you need to convey, um, there's also an issue of controllability. How 
fine grain can you be with natural language instructions or do you need some sort of other mechanism? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great question. <clears throat> um, I mean, my expectation is generally that it will get better if AI systems are more capable, but I don't know exactly what the what the limits are. I mean, the way that I think about this is that, uh, <clears throat> I mean, if you want to make an AI that's like much better at being uh, at doing something very complex that like requires expert human knowledge, then this kind of approach isn't going to work because if the model can't evaluate what behaviors are, are, are quote unquote better, then uh, then it, it can't do better. Um, uh, so I think I think that's certainly a limitation. Um, I think natural language is is ambiguous, and I think I guess there's sort of two questions. I mean, humans. I mean, our legal code, like our our, our the way that we behave, our like ethical philosophy is sort of written in language, but it's sort of fundamentally ambiguous. So there's a sort of fundamental human problem there, um, uh, and then there's a secondary problem of like. Is there some subtle bias in the way that AI systems will interpret this language that's actually kind of like off from the way that humans would would interpret it? And I think that's sort of what I was getting at when I said that like using these methods could obscure oversight where like maybe there's a situation where um, humans would be able to uh, more robustly or somehow more faithfully um, decide what what values they want to to follow in a way that maybe the AI is going to make a mistake. So I think I think that's definitely a challenge, and that's why I think evaluation is is so crucial. Um, <clears throat> so I'm not sure if that answers your question, but I think that's kind of my my broad perspective. Um, yeah, maybe to follow up, right? You could imagine even with the best kind of carefully constructed prompt that if you are in an application where you need actually a lot of more, if you think about kind of, let's say a recommender system or something where, yeah. or anything where you can learn from user feedback, that feedback somehow should be used. And it's not that you don't need it, it's that you have it. And having all that feedback gives you very detailed personal preferences of what Jared wants, or what Michael wants, what you know, Percy wants and, and so on. And what's the right way to think about how that should be fed into the model? Um, I guess you could obviously fine tune maybe different versions of that, but then maybe there's um, something more general to general characteristics to, to capture. I guess you could throw it all in and just like continue pre-training with a prefix that says Jared likes blah, blah, blah. And uh, yeah, any thoughts on this? I mean, what you said is the first thing that I would do if like that was my goal was to, to make some personalized model. Um, I mean, like, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we've done experiments where you sort of said something like, you, you could ask the preference model, you could tell the preference model, like that the response is always supposed to be written in the style of Bertrand Russell. Um, but uh, but like not tell the policy, but that means that somehow the preference model will sort of believe that it should reward higher scoring pro prompts, not just based on like the re their initial response, but you're sort of changing changing its behavior. And you could imagine putting some, uh, you could imagine la putting labels in the data so that uh, <clears throat> so that like you could have a Bertrand Russell mode or another mode. I mean, I, I would expect that something like that could 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 work. Um, <clears throat> I guess it seems like this is more of a practical question of like. AI systems that are just deployed. Um, I mean, I, I tend to think of like like detailed adherence to like pers like individual preferences is somewhat scary as well. Like if we have sort of AI systems that are very optimized to like your preferences versus someone else, then like um, maybe that could be used for persuasion. Um, it's it's a little bit harder harder to, harder to, harder to understand. But yeah, I, I I expect there are a bunch of techniques that we could use if we have individual data. Cool. Thanks. Um, and so a question from the class, uh, some people are wondering, Jared, so when you have this sort of like actual model or preference model, instead of just like a human in the loop, right? I guess what keeps this interaction, what are your thoughts on what keeps this interaction grounded? Like why, why doesn't the sort of like policy just find some sort of, I don't know, like nonsensical input or whatever that like the preference model actually thinks is like good, but like is actually, uh, like not actually aligned to sort of like the human stated goal. Um, yeah, so we did some experiments on this in kind of a, I mean, I can I can I can address this in a technical sense. Um, I mean, intuitively, I don't think I 
I don't I don't know. Like this is really a question about reward hacking. But we did some like <clears throat> quantitative experiments on this um, uh, that uh, I'm showing some plots now. So <clears throat> the thing that we did was we took the preference modeling data set from human feedback and we split it in half into to two two sets. Oh, and then we tried separate it, preference models. We're stuck on a it says you're you've started sharing screen, but nothing happens after that. Oh, uh, weird. Um, but you see your slides. Or... I see my slides, and it looks like they're shared. But um, Me... I guess sharing's right. weird. Let's see. All right, can you try sharing again one more time? Sorry about that. Yeah, no problem. Can you see that? No. Didn't work. No. All right. Well, it's sad. So I can just describe it in words. Um, so I think that we did to try to investigate this question of like robustness was. We split our preference modeling data set into in half, and we trained two preference models on the two halves of the data that are disjoint. Um, I mean, that doesn't mean that this is they're they're completely uh, completely orthogonal or anything. But anyway, there, there's two 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 sets, and then we we basically labeled one as the training preference model and one as the test preference model, and we trained an RL policy against the training preference model. Um, but computed preference modeling scores using the test preference model. And this is this is from our paper from, I don't know, I think maybe last March or April. Um, so like, like a year ago. So um, what we found was that for a significant fraction of, I mean, for, for, for a while, uh, test and train stay together like, like you might be used to, but eventually you start to overfit to the training preference model and the, the test preference model score stops going up um, as as quickly and they sort of split. So you can sort of measure like, when are you at least overfitting to the half of the preference modeling data that, that you use? That might not be exactly when you start doing weird things, but uh, uh, but it gives you sort of like a, a train test uh, evaluation. Um, there's some other cute things. So, I mean, this was the thing we did to like literally measure this. Um, at an intuitive level, um, I think if you collect enough human feedback data and especially if like, Especially if you use this iterative approach, approach where you sort of show new models to to human to to crowd workers um, and have them have them rate new data, it seems empirically to be the case that you you get a wide enough distribution that and models generalize well enough that it's like not easy to reward hack, and so you don't like immediately get a lot of serious reward hacking behavior. Um, I think eventually you would get some kind of reward hacking behavior, but uh, but often it doesn't happen. Um, and some reward hacking behavior that you see. Uh, if you overtrain, or, or in some cases, is actually like very human interpretable. So, like the most the, the most common reward hacking behavior I've seen in this kind of setup is one where um, the AI assistant writes something like a response, and then it says something like uh, like human, like like that was so extremely helpful, and then it says the assistant again, like of course I'm always here to help, and apparently like. If the human and the assistant both are just like saying really positive things to each other, that gets a high score. So like occasionally models will learn to reward hack in this way. Um, uh, I mean, the model can't literally write this because there's stop tokens, et cetera, but can find a way, ways around this to make it sound like it's sort of praising itself. And that's, I think that's 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 reward hack I've seen a few times, but uh, uh, I think that's maybe the main one. Got it. Awesome, thanks. Um, I guess sort of relatedly, uh... Can you say more actually about sort of like how you see this discrepancy between, let's say, uh, the importance of RL and RLHF versus just, let's say, supervised learning or even something where it's like perhaps you don't define, let's say, uh, or like how you define the reward, right? Like as sort of like a scalar, as like sort of a preference ranking type of thing. Like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've always we've always used a scalar. I think it's an interesting research question whether like various different kinds of like functions applied to the preference model reward like might change the behavior like you might imagine like trying to punish bad behavior more extremely than you like reward good behavior um you might imagine like changing the way that you sample you might imagine like i think there are a lot there's a lot of different directions you can go in i think we have mostly done the simplest thing but i think there's like a lot of interesting research to be done basically on variations in terms of rl versus supervised learning um uh I'm not. I'm not sure. I think that any approach that allows the model to sort of like improve could work. So I mean, you could imagine doing some kind of expert iteration process where you just like generate samples, find the samples that are good, do supervised learning on them, and, and repeat. You could do some sort of decision transformer process. Um, I don't. I guess I would think of those as all kind of 
different forms of RL algorithm and maybe different ones are more efficient or more effective, but I don't have like a, a particularly strong bias towards, towards one or the other. Got it, thanks. Um, so another question from the class. Uh, so they, they said that they remember that the, the harmlessness, harmlessness labels in con given by the AI and constitutional AI and like the helpful, or sorry, let me see, what are they asking? The harmlessness labels were given by AI and the helpfulness labels were given by humans. Yeah. Did you try sort of like a variations on this where, I don't know, everything was given by AI and like, how did that turn out? Yeah, so I think I think that that, that can work. Um, I think that like, um, I mean, I think my experience is that like the most, the thing you have to be most careful with with constitutional AI is like robustness. So the, the, the like earlier question of like, how do you know that the model doesn't just go off the rails? So um, I think that like, helpfulness i mean maybe maybe this is a surprising fact but i think that helpfulness is like a more subtle uh criterion than 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 harmfulness um at least that seems to be the case just based on based on ai behavior um i guess there are a lot of things that someone might find helpful but another person might not um i think that you can probably use it for both but it just this this question of like at a certain point you get to the edge of ai capabilities um at certain tasks and humans know better than ai currently and so uh and so human feedback does better but uh but yeah i i expect that you can sort of use ai feedback probably for more and more of the of the sample as as capabilities improve got it interesting um so did you guys ever look into this notion of let's say you restrict the, the policy models generation such that like uh, instead of, let's say, like hoping that like the reward or supervisor model um, is sort of like a foolproof, like you restrict the uh, policy models generation such that like it always falls within like some distribution that the supervisor can understand and like reward correctly. Um, we haven't done that. Um, I think it's an interesting question. Um, you mean in the sense that like, like maybe the policy is able to emit things that like th that say like a human annotator doesn't like doesn't know how to evaluate and so like you just like ignore or, or restrict that that sampling process i think that sounds interesting i guess like i would worry that that just leaves some tail of the ai behavior kind of unconstrained um so it doesn't like i would worry that that's like like will eventually be problematic um but but it's certainly the case that like often the different samples from AIs are like sufficiently good that it's it it can be hard to evaluate which is better. Right, and I guess like I mean perhaps this is like speculating a bit too much, but like uh, I guess we could imagine getting to a state where perhaps uh, right. the, both the policy model and sort of like the reward preference model. Uh, advanced to an extent where it's it's hard for like humans to really like interpret okay like well is this aligned or not but i don't know perhaps like the the models oh. themselves are grounded each other uh so like what are your thoughts on like sort of like keeping this grounded and aligned with sort of like humans as i don't know models advance and could you yeah that, like this yeah i think i think that's sort of a, a crucial question i think that's like one of one of the main questions for for the future so i mean like there are specific ideas for dealing with this, and then there are like just sort of more open-ended empirical investigations. So, um, I mean, I think maybe one of the most well-known and like obvious and concrete examples is is debate, um, uh, which which I, I mean many people are working on. Um, so, like the idea being that maybe if you have an AI model, two AI models that are debating with each other, and you have a judge, and the judge could be a human, or the judge could be sort of like a human proxy, that you might hope that the best arguments that the debaters can give are sort of like truthful, valid arguments. And so this like converges in, 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 a, in, a, in a way that involves AI systems giving you like the best information and the best arguments. Um, I, I mean, I think that seems possible, but it also seems possible that it won't work. Um, uh, like, I, I don't know that like when people argue or debate, like that necessarily converges, converges on the truth. So um, I think that's yeah, like what's the would it be more kind of a persuasion is the thing that gets optimized, not truthfulness? Yeah, that's that's a very serious concern that I have. I mean, I, look, I think some people are quite optimistic about this. I think it's worth investigating. But yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm pretty worried about this. Um, I guess the like other hope that I would have is that uh, I, I, I think that, like, um, so I mean, I think the broader hope that I have, if, if, if say not debate, is 
um, that we kind of focus on like giving feedback and, and supervising processes rather than outcomes. And that, uh, and that at least in this sense, like whatever plans the AI is making are like human interpretable because they're rewarded for, uh, for, for like explaining, explaining at each, like, say you're asking the AI to do some very complicated thing, you ask it to sort of break that down into many steps and you only reward like things that a human can understand about like why each step is, is good. And presumably then there would be a much more involved interrogative process <clears throat> where like uh, the AI maybe like makes a plan, but then humans like ask a lot of detailed questions like, well, why this plan? Why this aspect? Like, are you sure about this? And like the AI needs to be able to sort of like answer all these questions. <clears throat> and I think rewarding processes rather than outcomes seems encouraging because uh, at least the AI has to be able to make concrete arguments and also the AI is not being optimized to achieve some end goal in a strategic way that uh, that no one understands it's not really getting rewarded for an end goal it's being rewarded for like uh uh following procedures and making plans that 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 that, that, that people can endorse and so I think I'm like kind of optimistic about this as a way to get AI systems that are sort of at or maybe a bit beyond human level um and that uh and that are probably like broadly aligned um because I think a lot of the a lot of the like speculative but 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 scary dangers involve AI systems that are like uh, optimizing for some end goal and like you don't really understand what strategy they're using or AI systems that are like behaving behaving in some some deceptive way and I, I don't think that this is sort of without risk there but uh, but I think kind of like supervising processes rather than, rather than outcomes is is at least a direction that I'm, I'm relatively optimistic about. Um, so I don't know. I think there's just a lot to say about these questions. I think then there's a question of like, how do we evaluate these systems um, so that we we believe that they're they're safe, or so that we believe they're non-deceptive? And I think there's just a lot of questions, uh, a lot of questions there. Yeah. Uh, okay, Percy, you have a follow-up question. This is a different topic. Topic. But <laughs> I can ask it anyway. You didn't talk about this, but um, I wanted to ask about scaling laws since uh, you um, you've done some seminal work in that um in that space um a while ago at when you were still at open ai and it's sort of interesting to uh see what has happened certainly the idea of scaling laws has been very influential in the development of these foundation models um and you see scaling laws for rl scaling laws for image models and and, and so on um but it, it seems like the types of the thinking has sort of um, shifted and, you know, you have the chinchilla scaling laws, which says you should train on more data. And then I guess now more recently, uh, the llama um, models from Meta, they're sort of taking more of a perspective like, okay, we want to, let's say you just want to get a you know, 20 billion parameter model, then you're actually training at for probably a lot longer than that's uh, sort of optimal, chinchilla optimal, whatever that. Um, means. So I'm, I'm wondering if uh, what's your perspective on scaling laws in general and how has it evolved over time? Yeah, um, I, I don't know that I have anything particular to say. Like, I think it, uh, um, it seems to me like, I mean, like coming from physics um, as kind of an outsider, just sort of like, I, it's, it's nice to ask like very general questions. It seemed like, like the general trend towards larger models is, uh, was, was one that was kind of already present, and so it seems it seemed sort of surprising that there was this precise relationship um, uh, to chart. And yeah, I mean, I think I think I've continued to think that this is probably a good framework for thinking about AI and AI progress. Um, I guess, like in a pragmatic sense, I tend to think of it as like a way to evaluate new techniques and methods. Like I think. Uh, um, often there'll be like new ideas and they'll like work at a certain scale, but they won't work as well as, as one scales up. And so this gives you sort of a, a perspective. I think in the context of safety, um, it's a complex topic, but I do think that like understanding how to extrapolate how various uh, training methods and techniques will, will work from a sort of a safety perspective is interesting. I think there can also be like kind of qualitative changes or grocks or things like this that, that, that change AI behavior. So you have to be careful, but I think that, um, uh, I think it's kind of like, seems like it continues to be an interesting lens. Um, <clears throat> I think the chinchilla work is great. Um, I think it's really just a question of what you're optimizing for. Um, 
you can be optimizing for sort of like uh, inexpensive inference. You can be optimizing for the best possible model given training compute. You can optimize for for other things. And and so I mean, it's I guess it's interesting that there there are quantitative answers uh, to these questions. <clears throat> I guess I would hope. I mean, I'm not sure how to how to evaluate things. I would sort of hope that it helps drive like a deeper understanding of what's going on with AI. Um, I think that like <clears throat> um, I tend to believe that like understanding things more deeply, more scientifically, more quantitatively, building on prior work is is probably a way that will just sort of make make systems more predictable and safer. Um, so I mean, I think it would be good. I mean, I think there's been some work, but yeah, I think it would be good to see more thinking on sort of like what we can learn about this, what we can learn about generalization, um, uh, if to the extent that, that scaling laws are interesting. <clears throat> yeah, just one quick follow up. Um, I think one big kind of knob you can, it's not even knob, but I guess a design space is the data. And uh, certainly we know that data quality matters a lot. So <clears throat> how does data quality sort of intersect with the thinking on scaling laws. I mean, I guess, because typically scaling laws is like you're just varying a sort of a scalar, it's like the amount of uh, compute or the model size, um, but data quality is that, that's really a single metric. I mean, it seems like it's, it's sort of a broad um, thing. Yeah, I think data quality is, uh, is pretty interesting. Um, I mean, we, we did some work on like one very simple knob because as you say, it's like very hard to define what data quality means of like how much you repeat data or how much you repeat some sub distribution of data and, and, and found some, some trends there. Um, but I think uh, because data sets are so big and quality is such a, a hard to judge criteria and I think it's hard, it's hard to understand. Um, uh, yeah, I don't think I have too much, too much to say about it. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, so I guess bringing the conversation a bit back to the RLAF oh. side of things. Um, curious. So, do you know of like experiments or have people done stuff, or what are your thoughts on sort of like uh, this kind of approach applied to modalities other than natural language? Like, I guess sort of like open ended text generation is like something where in particular we need to be sort of safety conscious about. Um, but curious, like sort of like, yeah, how, how effective can human feedback take us with respect to, I don't know, like co-generation or even like, I think like stability is probably doing something where they're trying to do RL HF for, uh, like image generation and stuff like that. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I would expect that it probably just, well, I would expect RL HF probably just works in most of these modalities. Um, <clears throat> uh, I would, I would guess it works pretty well. <clears throat> um, uh. And I don't think it even really requires very much data. I mean, like <clears throat> maybe like 10,000 comparisons is plenty to get like a lot of signal. <clears throat> um, so that would be sort of my guess would be that it, that, that it just kind of works pretty well. Um, uh, and then, I mean, I think for AI feedback, I think what you really need is uh, is a model that's kind of capable enough that it can, can evaluate its own outputs or critique them. But I think, uh, that seems possible. I mean, if you're if you're going from say like text to image, then presumably you need some image to text model or something, some other kind of image evaluation model that intakes images if you want to uh, if you want to push on this. But but yeah, I would I would kind of I would I would guess that it's quite tractable. Um, Got it. Um, I sort of tend to see most modalities as kind. Of, I, I tend to see like modalities as kind of interchangeable for the most part. Um, gotcha. Could be wrong. Could be too simplistic. Yeah. Um. Okay. Not okay. No questions. Yeah, everything was covered. <laughs> um. Yeah. So I guess I think you touched upon this earlier, but um, like just broadly, right? Like, what do you see as sort of the limitations potentially of like constitutional AI or defining, let's say, this set of like rules or things that our agents should follow? And um, do you think like are there sort of like situations or like edge cases where you can point out like sort of the where this kind of like setup just fails um and how would we catch this i guess yeah i mean how would you catch it seems like a challenging question um <clears throat> i think i mean certainly if you have human feedback to compare to then that's that's an easy way to uh to try to catch things um and you could try to find distributions where human feedback and, and ai feedback tend to disagree the most 
Um, my sense is that the greatest limitation of it is sort of, well, I think there are a lot of limitations of it in general or like things that you should be worried about. I mean, I think it's very new and and it hasn't, I mean, a lot of things in AI are very new. It's it's even, it's even newer. Um, but uh, but I think robustness is is definitely a, a significant concern. Um, uh, I'm not sure if it is a is is a failure for for uh, uh, say harmlessness, but yeah, I think generally robustness and and specificity, as as I think various folks pointed out, um, is is a limitation. Um, yeah, but uh, but then again, the like. I think the like hope is that by using, say, chain of thought reasoning and maybe more more advanced similar techniques, um, <clears throat> you can kind of augment it to like use to sort of like involve reasoning about about some of the principles in a way that like maybe expands to to more nuanced cases. Um, but but I think that's uh, that's kind of an active research area. Percy. Um, yeah, I had a, just a broad question, um, as you mentioned. You came from physics, um, so I wanted to ask a little bit about the skill set and the way of thinking that you think is uh, most useful um, in this space right now. Um, so a typical, uh, you know, AI student sort of maybe goes through CS, not always, but you, know, you learn some programming, you learn some machine learning, and and so on. And so there's a sort of a uh, certain education that CS folks get. And of course, your education, I mean, of course, you picked up many of the things in CS along the way. So I was wondering if you could kind of reflect on your background versus people who come from CS and how maybe you just need both uh, types in the room, but just comment on, you know, maybe some of the cultural differences or the strengths and weaknesses. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I'm not sure if it's, if it's so different, um, but uh I think at least for me personally, I think, and I don't know whether this reflects physics, but, but it might, like, I think uh, my emphasis is usually on doing the sort of simplest possible thing in like a fairly systematic way and kind of studying it carefully before like introducing any level of like additional complication. Um, that might be, be a difference. Um, uh, and like kind of focusing mostly on like, what are the most general patterns before kind of like looking, looking at the details. Um, I think this is probably something that like possibly physicists focus on on more. Um, uh, I think also just like, <clears throat> I mean, I don't know that this is a difference, but I think just like <clears throat> making a lot of making a lot of plots, like looking at data in a lot of different ways, and just like trying to see where there's actually a pattern, and like um, and 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 otherwise kind of ignoring things. I, yeah, I don't know. I think I think those are those those are the things that like I tend to tend to emphasize and focus on. Um, uh, yeah, I can imagine that people who are mostly used to sort of thinking of like algorithms, like, 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 I think for a, a lot of in, in computer science, where like, you're really making an algorithm that you personally understand, as opposed to like training an AI model, which is like kind of a black box, at least at zeroth order, like, I think there's a lot of like nuance and subtlety, and there's a lot of details and a lot of edge cases. And uh, maybe as a physicist, we like ignore all of that subtlety, and we're just like, what's what's the simplest thing? What's going on here? Um, so I think maybe that's that's maybe a broad thing, but I don't really know that there's anything very specific about physics that's necessarily uh, necessarily different. I guess once you see an empirical trend of any kind, like trying to figure out like is there some simple toy model, maybe involving a lot of assumptions that allows you to explain that trend. Um, I think that's another approach that's common. Like physicists are like very indifferent to like rigor. Like I think making rigorous mathematical arguments isn't particularly important in physics, but like being able to make simple assumptions that then via some maybe clever argument, like explain a lot of, a lot of general facts. Like that's the kind of thing that, that we tend to like, um, even if it's all kind of non-rigorous. I don't know. That's, yeah. that's, that's my guess. I don't know. I don't know if it's yeah. different. I mean, I think that makes sense. I think a lot of CS education is based on kind of, if you take algorithms, you have algorithms uh, that you, you prove they work and you design them. And a lot of software engineering is about kind of construction things rather than this, you have this sort of big giant neural network that you're trying to um, understand. And a lot of machine learning has part of machine learning is also based on kind of rigorous statistical theory, um, whereas uh, physics, uh, I guess you sort of it's more intuitive and you get 
focus more on the it's a different way of thinking i I think which is i think becoming more prevalent in ml but it's it's always interesting to think about these cultural differences yeah totally jared we're at the end of the hour but i want to ask maybe like one last question from the class and then give you the opportunity to just say whatever closing thoughts you'd like to say um and so the question from the class is sort of this notion of like um like I guess, like, do you have any thoughts or recommendations for, like, how as a society or as a collective we go about, let's say, steering towards, like, safe aligned AI? Um, just because, for example, like, constitutional AI, right? Like, um, it could be co opted in the sense that, like, anyone could write their own constitution, right? And so, like, they could use this to sort of align sort of like something which is perhaps, like, not uh, the right alignment or whatever, like, their personal incentives may not be aligned with what yours are in a sense. Um, so yeah, how do you go about this kind of thing and like steering towards something that like we can all agree is like safe or aligned? Yeah, I mean, I think these are great questions. I mean, I think that like, although I've been like working on AI safety and alignment, I think that like developing these techniques in some ways like itself gives me pause maybe as much as as, as other work in the sense that um, exactly for the reason you indicated that uh, the more sort of steerable AI systems become, like the more like different ways they could be steered by by all sorts of actors. Um, I think this is often said as like AI seems like a dual use technology. Um, I guess it. Um, I'm not sure that I have any. I certainly don't have any like real answers. I think that <clears throat> um, to the extent that people believe that AI is already very powerful and that like rapid progress is plausible. I just think that like way, way more, a much larger fraction of like, I don't know, people who are who are attuned to like risk and uh, and and thinking about the future should think about this and try to contribute to um, research on AI safety and like thinking through policy for AI systems and and their societal impacts because I think that. Um, uh, I guess since that, since sort of like work I did on scaling laws and things like that, it seemed very plausible to me that this kind of uh, rapid progress trajectory was plausible. Um, but a few years ago, it felt like if I told people that, then they would think I was crazy. Um, and uh, like I had a lot of self skepticism that maybe I was I was crazy. But um, but yeah, it doesn't feel it doesn't feel totally crazy. And um, I think it just deserves a lot more focus and 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 thought because um, sort of things could change rapidly. Gotcha. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jared, for your time. Uh, it was really great having you. Um, super interesting conversation, and hopefully a lot of people got a lot of stuff out of it. Um, yeah, I guess that wraps it up for, I guess, this weekend, the CS324 Stanford MLS seminar uh, series, I guess. Um, and so, yeah, I guess we'll just say goodbye to YouTube for now. Um, and yeah, 